video was brought to you by Squarespace. You hear that? We're only on to episode three and we already have a sponsor. Greatest series on YouTube. So today I've got some exciting news. I think I cracked the code and worked out the formula that goes into making and writing these Disney sequels. What happens in the pitch meeting, if you will? You see, you have the one guy who's like, so how are you planning on making a sequel to this film? And then the other's just like, well, that's super easy, barely an inconvenience. We're gonna take a character from the first film who doesn't have a love interest and give them a love interest. And... That's it. Can't wait to get sued by Screen Rant for that. And I'm not kidding, almost all of the sequels follow this formula, or at least the ones I'm doing today do, and they all do it in a different way. You've got the boring one, you've got the predictable one, and you've got Mulan 2. Pocahontas 2, a journey to a new world. Wasn't that kind of the idea of the first one though? Like going to a new world or... Am I stupid or something? So let's just say this right out the gate. Pocahontas does not need a sequel. It's a perfectly fine film. And was way ahead of its time with the bittersweet twist ending that Disney just love doing now. Like, if we're gonna bring back the scale from that video, I'd say it's a solid eight or nine. And as you've probably worked out, since I just did that whole bit about them giving characters love interests that don't have love interests, Pocahontas being one of those characters, this film is probably gonna be a story about Pocahontas and John Smith getting back together somehow and getting mad. Married, or something like that. But to be fair to the creators of this film, this isn't actually what they decide to do. Don't get me wrong, they undermine and go back on themselves a lot, and this film shouldn't exist. But instead of her marrying John Smith, they decide to kill John Smith in the first scene of the film. Like, I'm not, that's literally what they did. Which, hmm, are Disney going to kill off one of the main characters in a film? in the first minute of a sequel. No, of course they're not. I feel like even when I was four years old, I could have worked out this was a fake out death. Like, they don't even show his body. That is the first rule of movie deaths. Unless you see a dead body, that person ain't dead. Which come to think about it, we don't ever see Sirius Black's dead body, do we? Guys, can we just ignore all the facts on this one and let me have it because it's been 15 years and all I want is for my series to be alive and okay. Anyway, since this death just wasn't believable and then they spend the entire opening of the film just showing people being sad about it, leaving me kind of already tired of this film. The plot gets set into motion as another ship arrives in America and Pocahontas decides to travel back with them to England to meet the king. Which, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't that just go against the entire first film's ending being that she couldn't go back with John Smith because she didn't want to leave her tribe, but now he's dead, she's just heading to Britain without even thinking about it twice. That totally makes sense. And when they arrive, there's a whole musical number just about how great London is, and I'm not gonna lie, I loved it. It's great. You should sing more about how great London is. I would watch a whole film of that. That's just factual information. Oh yeah, so there's this guy. I haven't mentioned him yet, but he's kind of important, as in, he's the main guy in this film, and I don't know how to describe him other than just saying, He's John Smith. Not actually, but you know, he's the one nice colonizer who actually wants to help Pocahontas and I mean, he's even called John. John Rolfe specifically. However, he might as well be called John Smith because there is nothing original about his character. They didn't even try to make him interesting and new. And we are oh. the same person. And I get it was probably intentional for this character to be just like John Smith, but I don't know, I don't get what they gained from it. It just felt lazy. I don't understand why they did it. So Pocahontas stays at his house while in England and then the king refuses to meet with her because he believes she's a savage. Can you imagine traveling all the way from America by boat? It would have taken months. And then the king was just like, eh. So she has to prove to the king that she's not a savage by attending a ball and brace yourself for this. The whole film is about her learning manners. I'm not joking. I sat for an entire film watching this knockoff John Smith and his basically blind mum teach Pocahontas courtesy and etiquette. Why? Why did you make this? It just goes on and on and on and on and on and on. You probably think I'm milking this now, but no, it keeps going on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Until finally she gets to the ball and new John is a love interest now, I guess. Someone clearly has a type for nice British guys called John. 
Am I right? <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad joke. And then finally, after about 50 minutes, things start to get interesting as she gets arrested at this ball, gets locked in a dungeon, and you're just like, what is she going to do except wait? Oh my god! Dom Smith has been alive in hiding this entire time. They only waited 50 minutes to bring him back. Honestly, it got to the point where they left it so long, I actually thought he was dead. Because I was just like, there's only 20 minutes left now. Are they really not going to bring him back? But no, they just made the great storytelling decision to leave him out the entire film only to come in for the last 20 minutes and save the day. Like, I get they're trying to pull off a Han Solo moment, but it came off more like, imagine if Han Solo hadn't been in the film before then, and you only got it because you'd seen Solo. That was a dreadful analogy, I'm sorry. And also, actually, if we're talking similarities to Star Wars, him coming back just creates the most awkward love triangle ever. Like, it's so... I was uncomfortable watching it. And if I've discovered one thing, that's what these films are best for. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is the film would have been a lot more interesting if John Smith hadn't been in hiding the entire time. And I honestly don't understand why they felt he had to be. Why did they even have to create this new guy? I'll tell you why, because twist ending, John Smith and Pocahontas end up going their separate ways and she sails home with the new guy. And that's how the film ends taking a character without a love interest and giving them a love interest. To be honest, I'm being overly harsh. I actually liked the new guy. He was all right. I just wish there was something that set him aside from John Smith. And I still don't get why John Smith had to be dead for 75% of the film, but the ending wasn't actually that bad. It surprised me. So for that reason, I'm going to say you got a third of the film right and give you 3.3 out of 10. That's not to be confused with getting a third of the film perfect. It's just... These numbers mean nothing, guys. Don't look into it too much. And with that unpredictability out of the way, brace yourself for normality because the next movie might be the most predictable thing I've ever seen in my life. Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. This one's actually called Hunchback of Notre Dame 2 because nothing interesting enough happened in this film to get extra words in the title. I'm not even joking when I say this film literally writes the plot out for you and then just rubs it in your face. And you might be thinking, well, isn't that the point of the plot? Like, it's just telling the story. No. I don't need to know the entire story 10 minutes in. And there really isn't even much to say about this one. It opens up with a musical number about the Jeu de la Mort, which my GCSE French, which I worked very hard for, tells me means, um, the day of love. I totally didn't look that up. By the way, that was a joke. You don't need to understand French to know what this is about. It's pretty obvious. We meet Esmeralda and her new husband who, I genuinely can't for the life of me remember his name. <laughs> Phoebus, apparently. I watched this film like two days ago and it's not even ringing a bell. <laughs> I, that was an unintentional pun. I've genuinely written ringing a bell in the script as an unintentional pun. I can't believe that. <laughs> Sorry. I've got way too overexcited about this. No one else cares. They have a kid now and are basically just there at the start of the film to massively foreshadow that Quasimodo is about to fall in love. Whose name are you going to yell tomorrow, Quasi? No one, I guess. Well, then who's going to scream your name? I don't think anyone ever will, Zephyr. Honestly, that's all they're there for, just to tell you what's gonna happen in the film and end up disappearing for the rest of the runtime. Until the very end. Then, immediately after this scene, we're introduced to a new character called Madeline, who I have absolutely no idea why she's been included in this film. What could be the purpose of including a female character in this film where a man who's interested in women is going to fall in love? not ringing a bell. Now Madeline is with the circus and the guy in charge of the circus is evil. That's his personality. He's an evil man. Don't worry, nothing more to it. So he wants to steal the bell, you know, the big expensive bell because he's evil and that's what evil people do. I really can't stress it enough. That is the entire motivation. And his plan is to get Madeline to seduce Quasimodo so he will reveal all the secrets about the bell so he can steal it. Which honestly, thinking about it now, he didn't even reveal any or many secrets about the bell. He just told them which was the expensive bell. That was all they wanted to know, apparently. And isn't it very obvious which one's the expensive one? I do not understand why you even needed Madeline's help. There aren't that many bells. Anyway, that's besides the point. Being that all of this that I've just mentioned was explained in the first 10 minutes of the film. So... Who wants to play a game of let's guess what happens in this very predictable film? We have Quasimodo, who's desperate to fall in love, and Madeline, the girl who is being forced to seduce him. Any guesses to what happens? If you 
said she sees him and runs away because she's absolutely terrified of him, you'd be right. I mean, yeah, but no, the film goes exactly how you'd expect it. After that kind of iffy first meeting, they meet again and start to get along, go on a romantic date and fall in love. But oh no, it gets revealed that Madeline was only pretending to like him to help the evil guy steal the belt, even though that isn't true. <gasps> That's definitely not the plot of just every romantic film ever. Also, just a side note, I really want to point out that they steal the bell by doing a magic trick on it so that it vanishes. And next thing you know, they're on some raft in the sewers, I think. Anyway, they lock Madeline up in the dungeon, which is becoming a very common trope in these films. I don't, every film seems to be locking people up in dungeons. Quasimodo feels betrayed thinking he'll never be able to trust anyone again until she says the words, Quasimodo, there's more to me. And with those four words, he suddenly trusts her completely and they team up and save the day. That's it, that's the entire film. I really can't be bothered to talk about it anymore. I'm gonna give this a 2.7 because it's not nightmare organ bad, but I feel like this is being very generous. So yeah, it's on the list. Which brings us on to Mulan 2, the sequel to Mulan. There really isn't much to sing about in these intros when films don't have words in their titles. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Good luck fitting this one into your stupid formula, Seamus. Quasimodo and Pocahontas may have ended their main films without love interests, but I've seen Mulan more times than you, and I know that she ends up with Shang Li at the end. And you're right, she does. This film, funnily enough, isn't about Mulan getting a love interest. It's about these three guys, Ling Yao and Chin Pao, getting love interests. To put it simply, they made an entire film based around the song A Girl Worth Fighting For from the first one where each of these guys finds the girl worth fighting for. Which, if you need reminding, Ling fantasizes about having a beautiful girl. Check. Yao fantasizes about a girl who will admire his strength and battle scars. Check. And Chin Pao fantasizes about a girl who'll cook for him. Check. So yeah, the film opens, and by opens, I mean after 20 minutes of nothing, they finally introduce the guys and they break into song and not an original song, they just sing A Girl We're Fighting For in this film again. And then almost as if by pure luck and plot convenience, Mulan and Shang are assigned to a mission by the Emperor to bring his three daughters across China to a place. Somewhere in China, I can't remember where, it's a big country. For an arranged marriage to keep the peace, which is kind of confusing because I thought they'd kept the peace in the last film, but Apparently not. So they get Ling, Yao, and Chen Po to help them on this mission to bring these three girls across the country, and well, it just turns out that these are the exact three girls they were describing in their song. What are the chances of that? So yeah, they don't really waste too much time here. One of the girls falls in love with Yao, like, instantly. Another one likes food, so... Well, uh, I mean... <laughs> and Ling takes a bit longer to wear his girl down, but obviously eventually she starts to like him too, and they all run off together. Only for Mulan to catch them and be completely supportive of them, because, well, I mean, this film wasn't going to be pro-arranged marriages, was it? But then when Shang finds out about it, he isn't as supportive, leading to him and Mulan having a big fight, and they break up. Oh yeah, did I mention there's this whole subplot going on of Mushu trying to break up Mulan and Shang? Because if they get married, Mulan becomes part of Shang's family and then he would lose his pedestal in Mulan's family and... I don't really get it. Mushu's basically the villain in this film though, so... Uh, yeah, that he's a reverse Iago. I liked him in Mulan, and then they decide to spend an entire film ruining him. And the writers really try to rationalize why he's doing this so we don't hate him too much by just drilling into our heads that Mulan and Shang are very different people. And therefore, maybe they just don't work together. I can't stress enough how often this comes up. We're also just throwing in loads of yin and yang imagery from the opening text to this necklace, which they're given at the start and they just keep looking at during the film, which really makes me wonder, how that all ties in together, like, I can't work it out. Also, I still can't believe that they stuck with this transition from the yin and yang symbol to the opening shot of the film. Like, is it just me or did this look so bad? I kind of get being careless towards the end of the film, but this is the opening shot. This is important. How are you going to lead with that? I'm not even an animator, but I think I could have done it better. And you know what? I will do it better, watch me. The thing is, it isn't even that hard. You just have to distort the image until it fits up. And then once it's faded out, you undistort the image. Like, I don't get how they found it so hard. Oh, would you look at that, it fits up. Anyway, the point is that Mulan and Shang are different people, but they work together, yin and yang. And after this whole breakup, Mushu realizes what he's done and comes clean to Mulan. And just as everything's about to get resolved, they get ambushed by some thieves. Cool fight scene. I actually kind of like this scene. They chase the thieves onto a rope bridge where the battle finally ends with Mulan and Shang falling off and hanging for their lives. So Shang has to let go 
for Mulan to live. Which brings us on to another classic episode of Disney sequel fake out deaths. I honestly don't know why they think if someone falls from a height into water, it's just, yeah, we're well, good. They can just climb ashore and they're, they're fine. Right now, this has happened in 43% of the films I've reviewed. 43%! However, despite this, it does lead into some pretty good character development for Mulan, or maybe I should say character continuation. Just what she does fits up well with her character. She puts her duty over her heart, letting the other girls be with Yao Ling and Chen Po while putting herself forward for the arranged marriage. And I wish the film ended like this. It would have been such a powerful twist ending showing there were actually consequences for their actions, but no. It's it's a Disney sequel! And Shang, back from the dead, runs in and stops the wedding so him and Mulan can get married instead. Meaning no one goes through with the arranged marriage and therefore the entire point of them traveling and the reason this plot needs to happen is kind of just rendered irrelevant. So I guess this one could be dubbed the pointless one. Yeah, that works. Also, Shang combines the family temples so Mushu can keep his pedestal as just the greatest piece of plot convenience ever, like, there are no consequences for anyone's actions in this film. But all in all, while I've been very unnecessarily critical of this, it's actually not that bad. It's a very cliche story, but I actually like some of the bits towards the end with the fight scene, Shan sacrificing himself, Mulan putting herself forward to get married. And I was surprised at how not bad it was. Like, I'm not saying it was good. My criticisms still stand. We're looking at a scale from very bad to okay and it wasn't that bad. Because since I've started this series, this is the one I've got the most requests for. Like, I've been told this is just unwatchably bad, and maybe that lowered my expectations so low that I was disappointed how not bad it was. And for that reason, I'm saying this was the best one so far today with a 4.6 rating, meaning it is third on the list, just below Aladdin 3, or next to Aladdin 3. Kind of. And with that all said and done, I don't really have a good way to segue into the ads. So let's talk about Squarespace. Because I want to paint a picture of you just sat around at home right now thinking, how can I show my work to the rest of the world? And I'm here to tell you that Squarespace is the perfect tool from which to create a website. Because with Squarespace, you can purchase a domain with free who is privacy, and from there you can build a community with like-minded people and interact with them in your comments section where they will only say nice things, I promise. You'll be provided with analytics to help grow your site to a wider audience, which I can only assume is something you want to do. And there's just so much more. So if you're interested or just want to support the channel, make sure to go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And once you're ready to launch, you can use squarespace.com slash Seamus Gorman for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. It really means a lot. Make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this video. You can subscribe to my channel by clicking here and watch another video in this new reacting to the Disney sequels playlist that I've just made like five minutes ago. And you can check out my Patreon. <laughs> That's all I've got for you guys today. I hate doing outros because I'm so awkward. I'm sorry. Bye. <laughs>